leave Kami before I have another heart attack. These lights are going to kill me! Anyway, um, welcome to Healthcare Trash Live. We were off last week. Why were we off last week? Oh, the symposium. Yes. So, uh, we're back. I'm just, I don't know what's going on here. We're still live. Um, oh, we're still live. Look at that. Uh, quick, we'll get some stuff out of the way real fast. Facebook.com slash healthcare triage. <laughs> Patreon.com slash healthcare triage. Check out the Reddit site. Watch the videos. We really appreciate it. May! May is opioid month. We're so excited for it. We've done a four-part series with the generous support of the National Institute of Healthcare Management on opioids. That starts Monday. All of May. It's going to be fantastic. New stuff on the videos. Super interesting content. We're very proud of it. Anyway, let us begin Healthcare Triage Live to your questions. If I can get to the right screen. Here we go. Question one from Liz Borino. Pennsylvania just legalized medical marijuana. One of the conditions it claims to treat is autism. Can you please explain how that works? I assume you're asking about autism and not how medical marijuana works. So look, um, I, wrote a I, I wrote a piece in this, uh, we didn't do this on Healthcare Church, did we? But I wrote a piece on um, the upshot on medical marijuana. We should probably adapt that. We should adapt that for an episode. Anyway, there's been some studies on like where medical marijuana has been proven in good randomized controlled trials to help with um, nausea um, and with pain, especially when it's talking about from uh, like... Uh, chemotherapy. Um, there's some evidence for other issues as well, but then it gets off on the rails and it's not really clear. Autism would be one of those. There's not a lot of good evidence. If for no other reason than we don't do a lot of research with medical marijuana in kids. We don't do a lot of research with medical marijuana anyway. Um, that's hopefully changing soon. Um, but I don't know how it's supposed to, how it's theoretically helping autism. Um, I don't know if they're talking about child or adult. I don't know which symptoms. I don't know what we're talking about kids with really severe autism or people more on sort of the Asperger's end of the spectrum. I don't know the answers to any of those things, really because there's not a lot of good data. Um, I'm sure that they have some tiny studies or they have some studies which I could spend time poking flaws in. It, I would just say I doubt that there's a lot of good concrete evidence that supports the use of medical marijuana to treat autism. That doesn't mean that there isn't like a reason to have medical marijuana because there are things which medical marijuana does seem to help with. Um, and uh, it, you know, to get into sort of that argument uh, is the real issue. Of course, as I say in the article and as I will say in the episode when I do it, um, a lot of the fights that we're having about medical marijuana are because it is at the moment a way for people to obtain it legally. Um, and if it was made legal tomorrow or decriminalized, we would no longer be discussing this because people would then just go buy it. Um, during Prohibition, uh, it was possible to get alcohol by getting a prescription from your doctor. There was medical alcohol. Um, and so when we had Prohibition, when something that everybody wanted was illegal, doctors were able to write prescriptions for it to get people it, that wanted to get it. Um, that is somewhat the, what we've got going on with marijuana right now. It seems that the arc of history is moving towards decriminalization and legalization. Many more states. I was just talking to my brother yesterday. He's a lawyer in Las Vegas, and I guess one of his clients is uh, um, one of the people bringing medical marijuana to, uh, to Nevada or to Las Vegas, where it is now happening. The, the arc and the trend seems to be going in this direction, and I think someday in the future we won't be having these debates anymore because if somebody with autism just wanted to try marijuana to see if it would alleviate their symptoms, they, would, they, they could. Christina L., what are your thoughts on growth attenuation therapy for the severely mentally disabled? My God, you people are trying to break me right off the bat. Wow. Okay, Christina L. is bringing up a very complicated ethical issue um, where there are some parents, there was a big case in, in Washington State, uh, in Seattle, which involved actually a number of people I know because I trained there, um, where uh, parents of a very severely mentally disabled child who had, you know, was never going to sort of come out of that disability and who they'd committed to caring for for the rest of her life um, and their lives, they, they wanted to use what we call growth attenuation therapy, which is basically to give her hormones to keep her from going through puberty and to keep her small because it was much easier to care for her if she never, you know, went through puberty and then grew um, because it was easier to care for her as a small child. It was easier for them not to have to deal with you know, periods and uh, a menstruation cycle and all the other complications that would come through considering she was going to be severely mentally disabled for the rest of her life. This brought on a monster ethical battle because is that right? You know, is it, is it ethical to 
to try to keep a child from developing. Um, and you know, many people had really good arguments on both sides of this. Uh, you know, about whether you know, really, the parents are the ones committed. They're the ones that are saying they're going to care for her for the rest of her life. They're the ones that have to deal with it. And given that she has, you know, no improved quality of life ahead of her, they can make a pretty good argument that you know, this is in the best interest of them. It's in the best interest of her. It's in the best interest of, of everything that has to do with their choice and their way of, of how they're caring for her. On the other hand, people make a good argument about that it's another human being and we're, we're making decisions and they can argue the slippery slope argument and everything else. When it comes to these things, I, Aaron Carroll, because I'm giving you my personal view now, not my, you know, research and evidence-based arguments here. I tend to get out of it. I tend not to try to offer and pontificate on what I think is right or wrong because I'm not there. I cannot imagine what these parents are going through. I cannot imagine what the physicians are going through. I cannot imagine what the child is going through. I cannot imagine making these kinds of decisions about having to be forced with these choices, forced to make these choices. It's so painful and complicated that I, when it gets to that point, want to remove myself. I think that that's a personal decision between the ethics community there, the patient, the parents, well, obviously not the patient in this case, but the parents and everybody else involved, and I try not to judge because it's so heavy and it's so deep that I, I don't know that I can, I can weigh in. I understand both sides of it. I do not see a clear path forward. I do not know what the right answer would be, and therefore I, I try to stay out of it. Um, because I know if I was faced with the same kind of heart-wrenching, no-good-choice decision, I'd want people to stay out of my business too. Um, so I, that's as much of an answer as I can give you uh, because I, I just don't know. Partially coherent. What evidence is there to support waking up newborns every two hours to eat? Oh, such a great question. Okay, so first of all, it's funny because I, I used to tell parents all the time, anyone that listen to me, only a fool wakes a sleeping baby. I mean, truly, that's just insane. Having said that, um, very, very, very early newborns could theoretically become dehydrated if they didn't eat for a long period of time. They could also get low blood glucose, which would make them sleep more. So it's like you don't want them to go a huge amount of time uh, before they eat. So probably what doctors do is to prevent any kind of bad outcome, they tell everyone, you got to feed this baby every two hours. I don't know. We have no good studies of this. You know, I'm going to bet the animals don't wake their babies every two hours to eat. Um, you know, and, and the world moves on. On the other hand, probably infant mortality among the animals is higher than it is in humans, and we don't even want to lose a single child to they didn't get enough food or drink. Um, the likelihood of your newborn, you know, becoming severely dehydrated or terribly malnourished, you know, once they're out of the very, very, very neonatal period is pretty low. Um, but probably for the first few days, people are a little more panicky and concerned. But, you know, in general, in our house, only a fool woke a sleeping baby. Um, of course, this was never really our problem. I would have loved if they would have slept more than two hours at the beginning. On the other hand, that was probably a lot of Amy and my, uh, my fault as well. Mostly Amy. Um, because uh, she was much more like panicky about their sleep and everything else that was going on. Mostly Amy. Dandy litigator. And I hope she's not watching right now. Dandy litigator, dairy fat, no, no, I'm sorry, dairy fat biomarkers associated with lower incidences of diabetes. Is this study useful? Is there any correlation between dietary intake of full fat dairy and these biomarkers? You gotta know that these studies are gonna be full. I can't even, I have not read this study, but the fact that you're saying biomarkers and associated and lower instances already, my, my klaxons are firing. That Was this a mouse study? Or was this a human study where they looked at biomarkers, meaning like insulin levels in a short-term environment after people ate that? Like if that's the case, then this has proven nothing. There's, you know, we, we keep screwing up the nutrition stuff and all of this. And it's also like, why, why are you eating so much dairy anyway? Has the milk industrial complex gotten to you? I mean, like, why are you so worried about milk? Humans don't even really need it. Well, God, I have made so many episodes on this. I'm not doing a rant right now. Um, go watch the many, many episodes I've written on milk. Go read the New York Times piece I wrote on milk. Um, I think we get too caught up in this. The, 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 if you're drinking a little bit of you know, non-fat milk, and you switch to a little bit of full-fat dairy, I don't think that's going to change your diabetes risk that much. Um, but I should, I would need to go look at this study fully. So, you know, tweet it at me or, or remind me and I'll go read it.
M. M. Belichel, I like that, very humorous. I just learned a bit about theories which say that certain types of parasitic infections may provide benefit in reducing harmful autoimmune function. So, uh, and then you say, I know parasite moth is behind us, but it seems interesting, particularly with Aaron's ulcerative colitis, what's the status of investigating and developing this at therapy? So, yeah, this is sort of known, that like infestation with um, parasites, some of the helminths, I think, and some of the other, other types of worms uh, actually um, can improve symptoms and sort of reduce the severity of some autoimmune disorders. Why? Great question. Um, it could theoretically be that the worms in some way, in order to save themselves, suppress the immune system in a way which provides some protection. Um, it could be that they release some compound which, I don't know, gets the body attacking something. I don't, no one really knows, um, but it is known. The issue with sort of adopting this is you're trading sort of one problem for another. You know, being infested with parasites is usually not a good thing. Um, some of them can be not good for you, uh, especially because they can come sometimes cause nutritional problems, which are also a problem with many forms of GI autoimmune disorders. Um, part of it is that, like, how do we control this? Like, you want to be a little bit infected, but not massively infected. And then, how do you stop the spread? How do you make sure you're not giving this to other people? Um, and, you know, we're just not positive. So you want to be positive there's a real benefit before you give someone a known harm um, so i think this is interesting and i do think it's being studied and i think people are looking into it um, but here's the thing look i my ulcerative colitis is at the moment very well controlled uh, so i don't really want to be infested with parasites i would rather take my medication daily and get my blood drawn every three months and not not really worry about the fact that there's tons and tons of worms you know hacked into my gi tract and drinking my blood it's just me but I imagine lots of other people with ulcerative colitis feel the same way. If I was really poorly controlled, maybe that's a different study, but I'm not there. Rowan Moran, what are some causes of postcoital bleeding other than cervical cancer? Many of the trans guys I know have experienced it at one point, but it's statistically impossible that's for us all to have cervical cancer. Um, so you're asking me a couple questions here. So I, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're asking me specifically from a trans perspective or just in general of postcoital bleeding um, out of a vagina because of cervical cancer. So, you know, just come on, just abrasion, I imagine, could, could lead to some postcoital bleeding. Um, micro tears, you know, something like that could lead to some postcoital coital, coital, excuse me, bleeding. Um, are you sure that it's vaginal versus urethral? I mean, you know, there just there's a number of things I would say that I totally agree that you wouldn't all have cervical cancer, um, but I don't also know it's possible if if it's it's if it are, if they are trans people who are also taking hormones if that might actually change the, uh, um, the physiology of, of of vagina in such a way as to make postcoital more bleeding more common. I don't know. I would certainly say talk to your doctor. I would not assume that all of it is cervical cancer. Of course, you always want to rule out the worst thing, but I imagine there are other things going on, specifically if you're talking about the trans community, um, I imagine there could be other things going on that could. So as always, here's my advice. Talk to someone, uh, a, phys you know, a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a mid-level practitioner, someone in the healthcare community that you trust. If it is specifically with, with respect to the trans community you're talking about, I would make sure you talk to someone who's actually familiar with and understands uh, the trans community and what people are going through and whether or not they might be taking additional hormones and something else that might actually be associated with this. Because I imagine most doctors um, might not be fully conversant on that. I admit freely I'm one. Uh, I don't know if, if any of the hormones or anything else that people in the trans community might be doing also might be interfering or causing you know, post-coital post bleeding to be more common. You should talk to a doctor. Photoshop Lily. From everyday experiences, it seems that people in their 40s and 50s are more prone to get diabetes. Is that true? If yes, why? Okay, so part of the thing is that, like, you know, increasing age is a risk factor for diabetes. So, you know, the longer that uh, you have had the risk of, of being getting diabetes, the more likely it is to occur. So as people age, they're more and more likely to get it. So you're going to see people in their 40s, 50s, and even older, more likely to get diabetes, specifically as obesity becomes more and more, has become more and more of a problem. You know, it's going to be more common in the 30s than it will be the 20s, and the 40s than the 30s, and the 50s and the 40s. So probably the biggest reason you're seeing it is one, because the obesity epidemic, and two, people are getting older. And that, that is definitely a risk factor. 
It's the same way as like, why are people more in their 40s and 50s more likely to die? Death is more likely to occur as you get older. As people get older and older and older, they're more and more likely to die. You know, the, the mortality rate in each decade is greater than it was the decade before, for the most part. There are some tiny exceptions like the neonatal period. Um, and kicker, I was told to get a partial colonoscopy by my doctor, but I've heard from other doctors say they're inferior and she only get full colonoscopies. What is the research there? We're, depends what we're talking about here. Are you talking about a sigmoidoscopy? Because a partial, I don't know of a partial colonoscopy. So if you're talking about a, like a flexible sigmoidoscopy, there's some growing research, especially coming out of Europe, because of course they do everything less and rational in Europe, um, that a flex sig is just as good as a uh, full colonoscopy in ruling out colon cancer. So why would you do that? Well, you know, if you go get a colonoscopy, um, you're getting full on you're getting anesthesia, you're getting constant sedation. Uh, if you get a flex sig, you get nothing. So it's cheaper, there's theoretically lower risk, um, it's faster, it's easier to do. Downsides, if you've never had a flex sig and a colonoscopy, I've had both, um, colonoscopy is much easier um, because you have to do the prep. Look, if you've never had either a flex sig or a colonoscopy, the prep is what sucks. You have to like drink tons and tons of base, now it's like Gatorade with uh, Miralax in it. But in the old days, it was this big thing of go lightly and it tasted like pineapple crap. And you had to force so much done. And by the end, basically, you were sitting on the toilet with the jug in one hand, drinking it out of one while it poured out of you the other way. It was awesomely horrifying. Um, and now it's not even much better because now you start out with like a bottle of mag citrate, which tastes like liquid death. And that gets your buddy going, and everything gets gurgly. And then you still have to drink like two monster Gatorade things full of go. And you're still basically urinating out your butt by the end. And it's miserable and it cleans out everything. And you can't eat for a day. And then, and then you go in for the colonoscopy and they give you the, the conscious sedation, which I will never endorse using propofol ever. Um, uh, you know, I would never endorse using it. Like Michael Jackson, you know, should not have been using it. But you want, like, it's you wake up feeling phenomenal. Like the, the 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 fact that I go in there and I fall asleep and I wake up and the colonoscopy's done is much nicer than being conscious while they did the flexing for me. And of course, since I was like a medical student at the time, the doctor, while he had the scope up inside my uh, sigmoid colon, tilted it up there so I could take a look into my own colon, which is not something I recommend any of you do. And while we're on that, I've also gotten to look into my own urethra and bladder. Think about all the wonderful things I've gotten to do as a medical student. Don't, don't ever do any of these things. Anyway, um, if you've had both a flex sig and a colonoscopy, you understand why people choose the colonoscopy. But it is higher risk. It is theoretically, you know, the anesthesia carries some risk. It is more expensive. That's what we do in the United States, though, because we like we like not having the pain of the flex sig. So back to your original question. Truth of the matter is that they're probably somewhat equivalent with respect for diagnosing, uh, you know, doing the screen for colon cancer. But if you're doing it for another reason, then this makes no sense. Like I, I've never gotten a colonoscopy to screen for colon cancer. They've all been for my ulcerative colitis. You need to do the full colonoscopy. A partial colonoscopy would not be good in that situation. I assume you're asking me for, for cancer screening. If that's the case, they're both good. You'll like one much better than the other. Next, uh, M. Avery, among medical professionals, do you think there's a bias in favor of pharmaceutical interventions and against behavioral interventions when treating disease? Why or why not? That's a great question. You know, and I'm not sure I have evidence. If you're asking for my personal opinion, I would say yes, because one feels real and the other does not to many physicians. It's like a drug we get, it's science. Behavioral interventions are much harder to do. The other thing, too, is it's easier to do a, a drug. You give people a prescription, they go off and do it. A behavioral intervention is hard work. It's very hard to change people's behavior. Um, and so the time, the cost, the effort involved is sometimes very difficult. I don't know that I would say they don't believe in them. It's maybe they don't know that they are as time slash cost effective. Aldrich von Klaren, is there a difference between how European food supplements are regulated and how is it done in the United States? I imagine yes, but I don't know the answer of how. Um, that's a good question we could look into. Ryan Rose, how do you feel about a potential sugar tax? So if you've watched the episodes we did on the soda tax, like I was terribly against a soda ban. I think it's sort of ridiculous for a number of reasons. Um, but at the time I said that I wasn't as much against sort of a soda tax. Um, but I think that still cherry picking soda is a problem. Like why is soda okay? Why is soda terrible, but juice is fine? Or beer is fine? Or, you know, milk, why is milk fine? Man. Um, but, um, but, a, but a sugar tax 
is trying to get at the sort of sugar problem in a little bit better way than the ban. Um, because one, it's, you know, it's a Bogovian tax. It's saying, yes, there are dangerous things that we do. We're going to tax them so that at least we try to discourage their use and at the same time get some money back. Think alcohol taxes. Think tobacco taxes. Think, you know, some other taxes. I'm sure there's a marijuana tax in some states. That, you know, that kind of thing. Um, that would be what a sugar, but it's very complicated to implement in the sense that like, you know, some sugar is natural. Are we going to tax fruit or is it only going to be added sugars? And then it's like how much, which kind of added sugars, how much it, so it, it is complicated. I'm less against it than I was the ban. Um, and I understand it, but I would, I'm hesitant because knowing politics, I know it will be biased and it'll be weird. Like it'll say like, oh yeah, sugar tax but not for sodas in the movie theater or not for like, you know, this company's blah, 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 because their lobbyists are fine. Or, you know, not for milk, even though they, you know, that's, you know, so it's like, that's the kind of thing where I'm like, well, this is just not real. So I'd have to see the actual tax before I would say I'm pro or against it, but I'm less against sugar taxes than I am against sugar bans. Just checking the time here. All right. Diana, the inorganic vegan. Do you think the fear of radiation from nuclear power plants is overblown? Well, when they're safely run and done, then I think it is overblown. When they like go belly up like they do in Chernobyl or in Japan, then it's a real problem. Um, but you know, it's like, this is where it gets to be like, you know, we all know the dangers in the oil industry and production and every, uh, production, production, pollution, um, and everything else. I don't, and overblown is a very relative word. Like there is a risk. That's a, it's rational and reasonable to look at a risk and say that's a risk. If you judge irrationally against other risks, that would be overblown. Um, but I'm not sure that everyone who's concerned about nuclear power plants is irrational. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, sometimes people do get crazy just they say radiation in the same way they panic about microwave ovens and they panic about cell phones because it's all radiation. Um, you know, there's radiation, there's radiation. Um, now, granted, nuclear power plants are radiation. It's the bad stuff, but you hope that the safety measures are there and, you know, the, and, and there are other things. So I, I think that probably there's arguments to be made on both sides of this. I don't think it's all overblown. I do, however, think some people do excessively, you know, rate the risk from nuclear power. Sophia Klimov, is long-term low hemoglobin levels, 10 to 10.5, a thing to worry about? My GP just shrugs, but it's been two years now. Oh God, you're asking me for medical specific advice and that's very hard to give and I shouldn't give it over there. I would say that you should talk to your GP, you should express your concerns and get them to explain to you why they aren't concerned. Here's the thing, there's a range of normal. Some people are gonna be low, some people are gonna high. We talk about people's height growth, for instance, and we say, you know, here's the fifth percentile, here's the fifth percentile. And then we say that as if like, oh my God, you're in the bottom fifth percentile. That's a bad, by definition, 5% of people must be in the bottom fifth percentile. When we often set norms for things like hemoglobin, that's done by percentile. We say, here's the 90 percentile, here's the bottom five, to anything outside the 90 is bad. But by definition, again, some people have to be in the high and low percentile. That's a definition. It's like just saying like, it's like half of people have an IQ below 100. That's by design. Like if 100 is supposed to be, you know, the midpoint, by definition, half of people are supposed to be. So it's like, you can't just fault people for falling high or low. Someone has to. So it could be that you're, in, you're the person that has a low hemoglobin level but is perfectly healthy. I don't know. It's important to talk about it with your doctor. I would get it checked. I would you know, make sure it's worked up. But some people have blood in their urine all the time. And every so often somebody demands they stick a tube up their, their urethra so they can see into their bladder. And it's horrifying and terrible, but, but some people just have this and they keep working it up and I can't stand it, but that's what it, some people have things and those are okay. And the medical community panics about them and sometimes people panic about them, but there's a spectrum of being on everybody. Uh, and so I would talk about this, but I would not necessarily be panicked about it. All right, last question. WizKid22193, your thoughts, your thoughts on restless leg syndrome. Do you believe it's a real disease or just a symptom? Wow, you guys are just trying to pummel me today. I don't know. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an ongoing debate about whether this is. I know people who suffer, and I don't ever tell people that they're, that they're suffering, that they're not suffering. The question I think that people more care more about is, you know, is this like an actual 
biologic physical problem or something that is more of a psychological or mental issue, then how do those overlap? And the truth of the matter is that we have to come to grips with like everything overlaps. There's mental and, and psychological components, everything. When someone is about to give a speech and they're nervous, and they're nervous their stomach hurts. And we can call that butterflies in the stomach, but it actually hurts. And we're not, I'm not saying that person isn't experiencing pain. They are experiencing pain. We can treat that sometimes with psychological measures, however. When I am more stressed, my ulcerative colitis is more likely to flare. I would not appreciate being told that like my flares aren't real because they are stress-based. That's still a real biologic thing that happens when I get stressed. My eczema can sometimes, like, the, which is really not a problem in many, many years, also can get that way when stressed. So do people perhaps develop more physical conditions when they have issues? Yes, of course. Sometimes are those physical conditions real? Of course. Sometimes is there an overlap between what's physical and we can cure with a drug and what is more behavioral? Yes. And so it's like I would spend much less time trying to say, is it real or is it a symptom? Then how can we help that person feel better? Um, and that often will involve some combination of perhaps pharmacotherapy and also some combination of perhaps uh, behavioral or even mental health therapy. And I wish we could stop trying to make this an either or thing and really work towards making this a comprehensive. We have to recognize that, that all of those things can help many, many things and we should work on them together. And that's where we're going to end. We will save questions here for next week. Uh, thank you so much for turning in. I see some good ones already there. Uh, as always, watch the episodes. Watch Opioid Month. Tell your friend. It's going to be awesome. Um, Patreon.com slash healthcare triage. We really always appreciate the support. We're using it to do things like opioid month. And you know, you'll see we've made some changes to the set. We try to do things. We're trying to switch it up. We're trying to do bigger and better things. We appreciate the support. Uh, Facebook.com slash healthcare triage. Watch healthcare triage news on Friday. Thanks for tuning in. We love you.